<laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, so uh, hi again, everybody, and uh, thank you for joining today's webinar. My name is uh, Shmulek Shapiro. I'm the Executive uh, VP for Business Development and Strategy at the RSAP Vision uh, Group. Uh, together with me, we have uh, Moshe Safran. Moshe is the CEO of our uh, US-based operations. And uh, Moshe will present himself in uh, just a second. Um, today, basically, we're going to discuss emerging technologies in AI for surgical imaging. Um, this includes a combination of uh, some of our hands-on R&D experience, some of the most, uh, I would say, up-to-date technologies emerging from uh, research institutes, and some real insights out of the uh, day-to-day work regarding uh, data and clinical operations that we actually you know, tackle each day with our um, ongoing uh, work on these kind of subjects. Um, and maybe if we'll have time, just you know, one slide, a few points regarding uh, risk mitigation and uh, maybe uh, some uh, new collaborative approaches uh, in this field. So uh, we have quite a lot. We have uh, around 27 minutes left. So uh, let's dive in. Moshe, the mic is yours and lead the way. Pleasure, Shmulek. I could not have phrased it better. So uh, for those, I feel fortunate to know uh, uh, quite, a, quite a few of you, actually. And for those of you who, uh, we, who have not met me yet, my name is Moshe Safran. I've been in uh, computer vision uh, algorithm development and across various aspects uh, for over a dozen years now, uh, both on the research and the technological side and the management side, uh, and also on the business side. Uh, and today we'll be talking, as Shmulek said, uh, about emerging technologies and AI uh, for surgical imaging. Uh, important for me to mention that uh, you're all invited to write in your questions uh, in the GoToWebinar interface, and we'll be taking your questions uh, at the end of the talk. Uh, so I'll start off by introducing our, our company uh, just a bit and talking about some emerging uh, technologies uh, from the applicative side and also a bit from the algorithmic side. And Shmulek will then review some of the clinical and operational challenges uh, from our point of view, based on our experience and from what we're seeing uh, in our day-to-day -day work, and also a bit about the risk mitigation, and then we'll open things up. Uh, for your questions uh, and uh, for some dialogue. So uh, let's get started. Uh, a few words about our company uh, for those of you who don't know, you know us yet. So we're RSAP Vision and our mission as a company is to develop and deploy and deliver uh, clinical, clinical grade visual intelligence solutions for medical applications. So all of our work and all of our uh, modules and offerings and uh, innovations are around uh, image processing and computer vision tasks uh, for medical applications. Uh, you can see here a few examples of our work. Uh, so on the upper left, this is a, a auto segmentation, which is a big part of what we're doing. Uh, this in particular is an auto segmentation of the airway tree uh, that's integrated into a clinical product. Uh, on the upper right, uh, this is an example of our work from cardiology uh, based around uh, auto segmentation of the ventricle, uh, precise measurements of heart function, and also uh, feedback uh, to the users. Uh, of this device, uh, in this case, quality grading of the ultrasound. Uh, this is also on its way uh, uh, to be uh, integrated and to be used in a clinical setting. Uh, and on, uh, on the lower side, uh, this is an example of our uh, unique 2D to 3D reconstruction a module that we've developed at our company. Uh, here we're uh, building 3D models, in this case of the knee joint, uh, but other uh, anatomies are, are on the way as well uh, from 2D x-rays. Uh, most of our solutions today, uh, as in you know, the world of computer vision and medical computer vision uh, in general, are of course based on uh, AI and machine learning, uh, but we're very focused on the medical uh, uh, specific aspects and taking the domain knowledge uh, of our uh, uh, in-house medical team and annotation teams uh, and working together with the medical device industry uh, in the U.S. and all over the world uh, to really create uh, focused solutions that solve uh, real, uh, uh, real world problems uh, and really provide the usefulness and value uh, to our partners in the industry. Uh, so that's just a bit about us. Today, uh, I want to talk about three emerging technological domains that are relevant uh, for uh, surgical uh, AI, surgical imaging AI, and surgical robotics. Uh, the first one, uh, the first domain is orientation and scene mapping. Uh, and uh, we call it this, it really combines a few uh, uh, image processing and computer vision functionalities. So semantic segmentation, which is uh, mapping uh, the scene, mapping each pixel in the scene, and understanding uh, what uh, uh, class of object or piece of anatomy uh, we are seeing. Uh, 3D reconstruction, visual odometry and camera pose, and registration in AR. And all these aspects, uh, we can look at these as sort of siloed, uh, separate computer vision uh, problems. But in many cases, it's uh, very important to combine all of this understanding of the scene uh, so that we can understand or so that our algorithm can understand 
what we're looking at, where it is uh, what we're looking at, and where uh, our uh, viewer is, uh, is in the scene uh, to create a full uh, integrative understanding. And in a minute or two, I'll uh, show you some specific examples of this uh, type of functionality. Uh, the second technological domain uh, we'll talk about is tracking and uh, precise measurements. Uh, so uh, there are many uses, of course, for uh, you know, uh, tracking uh, uh, technologies and landmark detection of technologies, uh, both to track uh, implements, to track landmarks in the scene, and also to perform precise measurements. We'll talk about a little bit about how these technologies uh, can be combined in interesting ways. Uh, and uh, perhaps if we have time, we'll briefly touch upon a workflow analysis, so offline analytics and uh, certain training, et cetera, is also a very hot topic uh, across the industry. Uh, and uh, uh, we'll, we'll talk about uh, this uh, just a bit if we have time. Uh, so uh, to get started on the first topic of orientation and scene mapping. Uh, so this is an example of a use case for semantic segmentation. So uh, this is a solution uh, uh, we're building uh, now that involves mapping uh, defects in the esophagus. This is a video of a Barrett's esophagus uh, patient. And uh, uh, what we're putting together here uh, at our company is a way to measure these defects and to assess uh, their size and to get sort of a, a more precise assessment uh, of the degree of disease here. And the first part is semantic segmentation. Uh, so technologically, uh, you know, there are uh, the common uh, uh, approaches, unit-based approaches, uh, 2D segmentation of each scene. Uh, this defect is fairly salient. In some cases, it's uh, much uh, uh, harder uh, to differentiate from the surroundings. Uh, technologically, what we're seeing here is that it's uh, oftentimes very useful to use not only individual frames, uh, but to use the history of this video. And there are different ways this can be done. Uh, so on the lower right, uh, this is an illustration of one way we are doing this. Uh, this is a 3D segmentation architecture. So simplistically, uh, we're just looking at this uh, uh, video or at a short segment of the video, uh, not as a series of individual frames, but rather as a kind of volume uh, in time and performing that segmentation. This is uh, useful to uh, sort of stabilize uh, the result across time. Uh, and there are other ways of, uh, of uh, performing this. Now, this uh, 2D or even 3D, but 3D in time rather than in space, uh, semantic segmentation is only a first step, right? Because uh, now we uh, know where this defect is uh, in, in, uh, in our images, but this still doesn't give us a good uh, physical assessment of the defect, which is three-dimensional uh, in the spatial domain. Uh, so the next uh, uh, component that's needed to do this type of measurement is to have some assessment of the distance from our camera. In this case, and in many cases, it's just a mono camera, uh, to have some assessment of the depth of this scene. Right, so here we're just trying to estimate sort of uh, roughly the size of the uh, lesion and get some uh, uh, correlates to um, some uh, uh, clinical information. Uh, we don't need a very precise uh, measurement in this case, but we do need some assessment of the 3D information. Uh, now, how do we do this? It's very difficult to obtain a ground truth uh, for this uh, type of problem. Uh, we're not uh, putting a 3D camera or a, a, you know, a, a time of flight camera into the esophagus or anything like this. Uh, but there are uh, uh, solutions that enable us to leverage uh, data from other domains uh, and to do that to train a model. So uh, the first uh, 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 solution that came out uh, a couple of years ago in the literature was called MIDAS, Mixing Large Data Sets. And what these guys did is they took uh, automotive data sets, they took uh, depth camera data sets uh, containing ground truth from a number of domains, uh, and they showed that this can be generalized uh, by some clever tricks of normalization of the input uh, and proper training, it can be uh, applied uh, to uh, generalize uh, out of distribution and to assess depth uh, in, say, medical videos, even if the system was trained uh, on different types of medical videos, different types of tissues, or perhaps even uh, out, completely out of distribution uh, data. This was the first step here. Uh, the second step which uh, this uh, technology took uh, uh, was a, a, a boosting-based uh, solution which merges low and high resolutions. Uh, so uh, many times, especially in these sort of smooth scenes, so you can get a local depth estimation, but then when you get away uh, from the local areas, either you get something that's very blurred or you stop seeing uh, the, the, uh, the large scale features. You start only seeing uh, the local features just because of the way uh, convolutional neural networks are structured. Uh, so boosting is one way or different uh, pyramid based solutions or multi-resolution solutions are one way uh, to merge the low and high resolution. Uh, still, you can see that we get sort of a blurred representation. We, it, it's not so easy to really pick up the sharp edges uh, and features in the scene uh, using these uh, technologies. Uh, and uh, the latest uh, sort of uh, uh, 
hot, uh, hot topic in uh, neural network architectures for visions. And this uh, started, uh, uh, as we all know, to take off uh, about a year and a half or two years ago, uh, at first in the NLP space, uh, the transformer-based networks, non-local networks, and, uh, you know, uh, uh, the developers of these uh, technologies have shown uh, very strong results in uh, NLP. Uh, so you have a, a natural language models uh, that are trained on text and can generate text uh, with very long-term correlations, text with, you know, a beginning and an end in multiple paragraphs. You have an idea that looks like it's being uh, developed uh, because of their non-local nature. And recently, uh, transformer architectures have also been applied uh, to visual data called the vision transformer. Hang on. Uh, and uh, the main feature of this architecture uh, that makes it uh, uh, has made it so effective in NLP and is starting also to show uh, very interesting results in the visual domain is this uh, uh, component called the multi-attention head. So the idea here is uh, that instead of using convolutions, which are looking uh, locally and then looking a bit more globally and gradually looking at larger scales, what you do here is that each patch is allowed uh, to, uh, to talk to in a way or to be represented by uh, the embedding of any other patch in the scene. So uh, the architecture is built in a way that the response at any one local uh, uh, location can depend on any other location, whether that's near or far away. Uh, this is all trainable uh, in this multi-attention head. Uh, and uh, again, in the NLP domain, uh, this uh, allowed for sort of a very uh, long range uh, correlations. It wasn't, uh, uh, you sort of increased the memory uh, of the system. Of course, uh, uh, according to the size of, uh, of the training data that you can feed into it and the size of the uh, uh, input you can feed into it. And in the visual domain, what we see is that this enables these sharp edges to be picked up. So because uh, we get rid here of the, this is using only patches, it's not using convolutions at all. And because this uh, uh, structure, this network architecture gets rid of the local bias, the local tendency uh, uh, sort of assumption that's uh, based in, uh, that's built into the convolutional architecture uh, that uh, pixels are typically uh, the response or the desired response that a typical pixel is uh, typically dependent on its nearest neighbors, you get these sharp edges and you also can get the long-term uh, dependencies. So you see that we know that this uh, area of the scene here, which is fairly flat, uh, the system can learn uh, that it is indeed uh, flat and not to uh, uh, blur uh, the edges between the different areas. Uh, and again, there are still challenges to really uh, take transformers uh, uh, from the research or uh, from uh, uh, the uh, R&D state uh, into uh, reality because uh, they tend to be data hungry. Again, the ability to train on multiple domain data sets makes this a little bit easier. Uh, there's also runtime uh, challenges. They tend to be very heavy architectures, uh, but we are seeing that technologically, uh, this is something that uh, we expect to become uh, more and more important over the next uh, a couple of years in the visual domain as well. Uh, take another example of orientation and scene mapping. Uh, so uh, let, let's say uh, we want to uh, do uh, some uh, sort of similar task for uh, arthroscopy. Uh, so this is a knee MRI, and a knee MRI uh, gives a lot of information, both about the bones uh, and the soft tissues. And segmenting an knee MRI uh, is, uh, I wouldn't say it's an easy task, but it's sort of a, a, a today it's sort of a proven uh, computer vision technology. So using a, a sort of well-known uh, auto segmentation architectures and proper management of the data, uh, this, this again is uh, our work in this case, uh, as well as the previous one, we can segment the bones, the cartilage, uh, soft tissues, ligaments, and get a very, very good 3D mapping uh, of the scene, again, in the pre-op imaging. Now, what happens if we want to go uh, intra-op, if we want to start looking at arthroscopic video and provide uh, uh, the user or the surgeon some sort of orientation in this scene? Now, as we can see in this uh, uh, video here, an arthroscopic camera video, is much more challenging than this MRI for a variety of reasons. So the camera is moving all the time. We have a limited field of view, right? We're only seeing, in this case, a very, very small portion uh, of the condyles of the knee at any given frame. Uh, it's, uh, of course, uh, typically a 2D image only, and the surfaces are very smooth. So, uh, uh, you know, classical tracking algorithms and even learned tracking algorithms uh, need edges, need features to pick up on to be able to follow. Once the surfaces are smooth, there are actually very few cues uh, about the depth present uh, in the scene. Uh, we really need uh, uh, to have uh, special solutions uh, and to use uh, uh, proper uh, learning algorithms to understand uh, what the depth is of, the, uh, of what we're looking at. Uh, and of course, there's camera motion and also inconsistent lighting. So what, what can be done uh, for this type of scene? How can we provide uh, some sort of 3D uh, visual orientation 
uh, in this type of challenging uh, video. Uh, and uh, so uh, the first step here, of course, is depth estimation. Again, uh, at, at first, uh, so it depends on the application. Uh, basically, uh, we want uh, some rough depth, depth estimate and maybe use that MRI uh, to refine that depth estimation. Uh, this needs to be a learned solution. So the transformer-based solution I showed you uh, uh, in the previous slide uh, performs this way on this arthroscopic video. Uh, the result looks pretty good. Uh, this is a different video. This is an arthroscopy uh, of the shoulder. And again, uh, the results uh, uh, visually uh, seem to make a lot of sense. It's quite challenging, again, to get ground truth. Uh, for this type of uh, uh, video, especially if you want to, uh, to show uh, how things are performing on real uh, human procedures. Uh, but this is a very important uh, first step, this depth estimation, uh, because without it, uh, we really have no chance of getting a 3D orientation. Uh, now, now uh, we're, of course, not the only ones that are working on, the, on these tests. Uh, we're uh, reading a lot of, of stuff that's going on in the academic world, as well as hearing a lot uh, from our colleagues uh, what's happening in the industry. Uh, this is one interesting paper uh, we've come across recently, 3D semantic mapping from arthroscopy using out-of-distribution pose and depth and in-distribution segmentation training. So what, what are these guys trying to do? So uh, a few interesting features uh, that sort of caught our eye in this paper. Uh, the first thing is that they're trying to jointly estimate a number of, uh, of uh, uh, properties of the scene at the same time. So instead of separating the tasks and solving them uh, separately, they're jointly estimating both the 2D semantic segmentation, in this case of uh, different uh, parts of, uh, of the, the anatomy that are being viewed, uh, at the same time estimating a depth map, and at the same time estimating a camera pose. So uh, as we see in many cases, uh, multitask learning uh, can be very helpful uh, to get a good result. Uh, the second aspect of this paper uh, that, uh, uh, again, is, is sort of uh, something uh, that uh, we're starting to use a lot and that we're seeing a lot, also in our uh, uh, travels in, in the, in the uh, world of AI is semi-supervised learning. So uh, for semantic segmentation in this kind of scene, it's possible to create a ground truth. So you annotate the scene, uh, you have a, a, you know, orthopedic surgeons, uh, you can uh, uh, create a process to annotate them and to supervise the process, uh, and you can get a, an annotation of the semantic segmentation. Depth map, uh, so in this case, depth maps uh, were not available uh, at all. Camera pose. So what these guys did was pretty cool. So they had a, a, a human data set, uh, which was uh, you know, collected uh, with some hospital collaboration. They didn't have any camera pose information there. It was just a standard uh, arthroscopic video. And then they also collected, in this case, an, an animal uh, data set. I think it was from a, a sheep knee or something similar. And for the animal data set, they were able to acquire uh, this uh, ground truth camera pose estimation. So if you know the camera pose, that can tell you a lot about uh, the right depth map to build. And then they uh, leveraged, uh, again, combining multiple types of data sets. Uh, this is something uh, that I mentioned before. This can be quite important, combining human data uh, with animal data uh, and uh, doing the proper normalization and the proper uh, data augmentations uh, to be able uh, to actually leverage both types of data to uh, generalize across the domains. Uh, and also the semi-supervised approach. So some of the data has ground truth uh, in this case for camera pros and for 2D segmentation, uh, other outputs that do not contain ground truth uh, and uh, uh, creating an architecture, in this case, uh, uh, the architectures themselves are fairly standard, uh, unit-like uh, architectures for the segmentation and the depth and a standard kind of a classifier or, or regression network uh, for the camera pose uh, parameters uh, and combining all these aspects, uh, again, to solve a real world problem under the real data limitations uh, for uh, uh, this type of situation. Uh, so I uh, personally found this uh, paper uh, uh, quite uh, interesting. And, and these aspects, again, of, of sorting, sort of uh, uh, solving for the real world challenges, so multiple types of data, generalizing across domains, uh, multi-class uh, learning, 3D information, not only 2D and semi-supervised, these aspects are, are, are something that we come across uh, again and again uh, in our work. Uh, and in our experience. Um, okay, so this is about the uh, orientation and scene mapping. Again, uh, uh, and purposely we give this a very general uh, title because uh, uh, the application and the use case, uh, uh, th there can be many different applications and use cases uh, for this type of uh, capability. Uh, it's uh, really about both understanding the scene and also understanding uh, the observer's uh, uh, position in that scene all at the same time. 
the, the second topic uh, I wanted to touch in on again on the technological side is tracking and measurements. So, uh, you know, we, we've seen many, many uh, uh, works and uh, many people are, are doing uh, uh, tracking of uh, key points on tools uh, for many applications. So uh, uh, a lot of companies are saying, uh, yeah, our camera is going to follow the tools uh, based on uh, this tracking, uh, pose estimation uh, of the tool, uh, all, all kinds of uh, uh, features that uh, sort of uh, the whole uh, surgical intelligence industry is really uh, either promising or uh, or starting to to build and, and to demonstrate already. Uh, technologically, uh, some interesting points uh, we see here. So if you want to track key points on a tool, uh, we find it's useful to look at this as a pose estimation problem, right? So in 3D space, the distance between this point and this point over here is going to be constant, right? Because this is a rigid body. Of course, in the image, it can vary a bit, but there's a, a, some correlation here, right? Because we're seeing the tool at uh, various angles. Uh, so we find it useful not only to do these kind of heat maps, in other words, just to detect these points and to track them, but to really use, so this is, you know, the classic uh, uh, open pose architecture, but there are other ways of introducing uh, these relations between the various points uh, into the algorithm itself. Uh, this can be very useful uh, to solve the tracking problem. Now, once we know uh, where these points are on the tool, uh, th this opens up uh, uh, many interesting possibilities, right? So uh, having a camera uh, follow a tool is, is, a, is a common uh, use case. Uh, a lot of people want to see that. Uh, but there's also the subject of measurement. So this is an example uh, just from a Sage's uh, uh, standard uh, video. This is a, a sleeve gastrectomy uh, operation. Uh, and the surgeon is measuring, uh, in this case, I think it's six uh, centimeters uh, along uh, uh, this part uh, of the stomach. And this is the way uh, surgical measurements are done today, right? So this is a surgical ruler and it's introduced in, in the scene. Uh, you know, it's, it's sort of uh, hard to see. Uh, it's not uh, very precise and it's a manual uh, and physical process. Now, uh, having these tools uh, in the scene uh, with uh, uh, a known structure is really introducing a kind of a ruler uh, into this uh, into the surgical scene. Uh, so, uh, you know, uh, doing this, doing it, uh, using it manually is difficult. It's much easier with our own eyes to see numbers on a ruler and uh, and uh, to perform the measurement. Uh, but uh, for a computer uh, algorithm, it's actually quite quite uh, uh, straightforward to detect these points. Use uh, say this line or maybe only uh, maybe this uh, triangle under certain constraints as a kind of uh, self calibration uh, body. And then once we have that we can have a, a, a precise measurement and a depth estimation by using the tool itself uh, as a pointer. Uh, we think uh, this can have a, a lot of uh, potential and, uh, and usefulness uh, in the surgical field. Uh, so just, a, just an example of an interesting use case uh, for tracking and measurements. Uh, yeah, so, so again, it's, uh, to sum it up, I would say that uh, uh, it's uh, it's very important to select uh, the technological solutions that are suitable uh, to the inputs that you have into the situation that you have. So there's always going to be, especially in the surgical field, uh, there are uh, very uh, difficult uh, data uh, availability constraints and hurdles. Uh, you know, there's been some talk within the industry on how to uh, provide better access to data, but uh, this is a limitation that's going to be with us for a long time, right? So the uh, uh, you know, the well-known uh, uh, Collect80 uh, data set of cholecystectomies uh, for uh, AI is called Collect80 because there's 80 videos. Uh, that's uh, not a very large uh, sample size for, you know, independent samples uh, in machine learning. Uh, so we're always going to need to generalize across domains to leverage uh, training data from one domain uh, to another, from animal to human or even non-medical uh, to medical. Uh, there's always going to be uh, 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 these uh, challenges that we need to select uh, the right algorithms in order to overcome. Uh, and so to tell us uh, a little bit more about uh, these challenges uh, from his experience, again, on, on uh, managing a lot of the, the clinical side and the collaboration side of, uh, of what we're doing vis-a-vis uh, -vis the medical world and also the industry, uh, we have uh, Shmulik here. Uh, so Shmulik, tell us a little bit about the clinical and operational challenges uh, that we're facing because, again, uh, some people like to say it's not it's not about the AI or not only about the AI and not only about the technology. It's really about uh, bridging the gap and uh, doing that uh, uh, cross-functional uh, crosstalk uh, to get things done. Right. Yeah. Thank you, Musha. So, so yeah, I, I truly uh, agree with that. You know, saying there's uh, even a debate is the data the most important thing in the company, or at least one of the most important things. 
I personally think uh, it's one of the most important things because there are many aspects to be to develop a successful solution and push that into the market. But it definitely it's extremely important. Um, and when we talk about data, there are many aspects within the company that need to be uh, recognized and handled and, and managed all along the R&D uh, phase and even after that in, in regards to the uh, data requirements. And uh, we'll review a few of, a few of these uh, in these uh, two, three slides. So uh, we can see here that I divided it to a few uh, different you know, uh, sectors, starting with the training data. So that's like the, be the basic data that we gather to start the development with and base most of it on top of it, at least at the initial phases. And I would say that's the, the, the first, maybe of a second question we're always asked is how much, okay? How many studies do we need and so on? So that's a good question. And actually the, the response to that is depending on the specific task. So let's uh, take, for example, two uh, common tasks, one of them uh, segmentation and the other maybe classification. So uh, I would say as a thumb rule, if we're talking about uh, segmentation, once again, if we're talking about 3D segmentation, so we can start with something around 200, 300 maybe uh, studies that we can start with that's sufficient to have some kind of initial POC and then moving forward towards uh, uh, production and an actual uh, working solution in, in real world, we're talking about more or less a thousand studies. That will be uh, the number. And if we're talking about 2D data like um, ultrasound images or X-ray maybe, uh, so we'll need, all, we'll need uh, to get to a production level probably uh, several thousands of uh, different images. That's regarding segmentation. If we're talking about classification, so uh, uh, once again, the farm will be more or less a thousand uh, studies um, per class. Okay, so for if, for example, we have one without cancer, one with uh, a tumor, or something like that, so we'll need two thousand uh, images. Um, and to get to a production level, we'll need probably around uh, ten thousand. So I know it, it sounds, you know, uh, a very enormous number and maybe frightening, but just take in mind that uh, if we're talking about classification at least, so we don't need that tedious task of uh, very uh, accurate annotation, so it's easier. So even though the number is high, let's not be intimidated by that. Um, diversity, so of course we need to have a very, uh, um, I would say diverse data set, but we need to remember something else, but we also need the network to recognize very accurately how uh, um, a healthy organ looks as well. Okay, at least depending on the use case. So once again, I would say that around 30% of the data needs to be uh, relevant and presenting uh, healthy um, organs as well, and the rest uh, should be diverse. And of course, uh, unique pathologies, depending on the use case, you know, and different kind of artifacts need to be represented, just as represented in the real world of that of that use case. So that's uh, regarding the training data. Uh, let's move from there to prospective studies. Okay, that's I would say. Uh, data that specifically collected and even, uh, um, uh, I would say, produced in a way towards a specific study and the development and doing the uh, testing and verification of the solution. So um, many of these cases, of course, it involves uh, medical centers, specific sites that will run this and actually cover the data, but also in many cases will include a a unique flow, maybe a jig that needs to be added or, or a different uh, way to position something of a patient or depending on the use case. Uh, but there are a lot of aspects here. One of them, by the way, is uh, the PI, the primary investigator, who's going to lead that. Do we have a strong, what do we have a reason to do it in that center or a different one? Uh, is that a KOL that we want, to, of course, him to, to be supportive towards the research and the rest of uh, the company's uh, efforts. So there are a lot of considerations regarding the gathering of a prospective studies and that's a big issue. And like Moshe said in this uh, specific area, sometimes it's very challenging and we actually deal with that, I would say, on a weekly basis. Uh, it's something that you need to manage all the time. I'll, I'll show you in the next slide like uh, a flow of that very quickly. Let's talk about hospital collaboration, okay? So we need to take care of that, of course. We need to handle research protocols from the beginning. We need to make sure that we have all the relevant Helsinki um, uh, committee um, uh, documents and uh, approvals and everything. So it could be the IRB, it could be the ICE, everything that we, we know about. 
uh, everything around the agreements themselves, data license agreements, uh, data transfer agreements, depending on, on the entity, we'll talk about that. And of course, team uh, contributed, uh, contributions, I mean, um, what's for the hospitals, team out of that, what kind of commercial aspects do you have? How do you encourage the team to participate with that, uh, the technicians, all the sound technicians, the physicians themselves? Different aspects, different uh, sites, but you need to be on top of that and manage that all the time. And of course, regulatory aspects, okay? So if we're talking, for example, about the FDA, so is that data that we're aiming at, is that relevant for uh, the intended use that we are actually going to uh, uh, submit um, regulatory pathway, okay? Is that in accordance with that? Uh, predictive devices, so if we're talking about the 510K, for example, and we have a predictive device, is that data similar to the data that has been submitted in that specific predictive device and so on? So we need to be uh, very uh, careful and make sure that everything is in correlation because otherwise we'll make a lot of effort and it's not going to be in the right uh, direction. Uh, Moshe, the next slide, please. Sure. Yeah, so yeah. the training is the easy part, right? The validation is really easy. <laughs> Purdue, yeah, yeah the, the technology is easy. I know you guys can do that, but how, how are we gonna validate it? How are we gonna get, how are we gonna get it past the, the FDA? Yeah. <laughs> yep, I agree. So uh, we can see here some kind of flow, uh, you know, that we're working with once again on a daily basis within the company and most of our clients are doing similar things. So it was, uh, I would say the first part is the data providers. When I say data providers, it, uh, let's talk about um, having at least, I would say five to 10, but not one for sure. We need to have several ones. We actually work with more than 10. Uh, so we'll have, you know, uh, sufficient sources for different kinds of projects and uh, I would say modalities and use cases. But uh, in hand, anyhow, you can count here medical centers, uh, data vendors, quite a few today, uh, smaller clinics sometimes. Uh, you need to have a very uh, sufficient geographic spread depending on your uh, regulatory path and depending on your uh, you know, uh, go-to-market strategies as well. Um, and of course, you need to take into consideration uh, market aspects as well. Okay, is this specific site or is this source going to be the one that I'm going to work with in the future or is this just a one-time deal? We need to manage that. Let's move forward, relationship structure, okay? We need to have everything in place, intact, determine the collaboration structure and have a legal agreement. Uh, I would carefully say that in, in most cases, let's prefer a simple data provider structure as much as possible, because if the IP is involved, you know, and some kind of more, uh, I would say a deep collaboration, it's a lot more complicated and uh, actually closing the agreement will take a lot more time and, and uh, complications. So if you can just have a data transfer agreement or data license agreement today, the DLA is, is more common because most of the sites will not actually transfer the, the data to you, but give you some kind of a, a license to use that uh, for a specific uh, a development. And of course, is it a short time task or a long time uh, collaboration? You need to take that into considerations. So it seems as if the second we got the data, that's it, we've got to the promised land, but as you know, it's not that simple, uh, a lot more to be done. First of all, we need to have clinical validation. Is the data that received actually the one that we were aiming to get from a clinical perspective? Anonymization, of course, just to make sure sometimes it's challenging. In ultrasound, for example, some, some machines uh, or ultrasound cards are easier to handle, some are more complicated. You need to make sure, you know, and sometimes uh, manually, but everything is according to uh, uh, you know the legal aspects. Um, does it fit to your specific use case? Of course, like we talked about FDA submissions and so on. Uh, in regard to, to patients that you're aiming at, okay, does it fit to that uh, uh, structure? Uh, of course, exclusion criteria, okay. Sometimes taking care of all these and replacing the data in the right one takes a lot of time, and we do that all the time in parallel to the actual development. So we don't have a lot of time. I would just say that this is ongoing effort all the time within the company because all, each time you need to visualize the next stage, okay? We have new development. We have the clinical trials coming on. We have uh, sites that are going to be used as uh, reference sites and things like that. So keep that in mind all the time when you manage uh, these cycles. A lot of work, like Moshe said. Moshe, next slide. Yeah. So like I promised, just one, one slide, one minute about this. 
uh, risk mitigation and some kind of collaboration strategy. So wh why do we need at all risk mitigation and management? Because the investors are looking to lower the risk, okay? The market is becoming more complicated. We see more and more companies getting into this field. We see companies developing uh, small case and specific robotic systems. And we know that the next stage of the development, the next stage of the application is actually more, more challenging and more complicated than, let's say, you know, the first generation. So uh, there's a lot of risk that needs to be mitigated here and managed uh, very carefully. And what we see today, Moshe, can you press the, the bar? Um, that actually, that makes a bit of a difference in the market. So today, instead of working in the regular uh, model that we see, you know, investment and funding grounds, and only when the company is um, at least well established and proves the te technology and everything has, you know, traction, then it's interesting for the larger players. So we see today that there are more and more, uh, I would say, early stage collaboration between these AI innovative uh, companies and the larger players, the vendor themselves, the device manufacturers, uh, things like build to buy, okay, and a bunch of different, you know, range of uh, flexible models. It's not more like the structured funding that we, we saw a few years ago, because there's a, a, an understanding that the large companies, they understand the market, they understand the end users, they understand the physicians, and they actually know quite a lot. Moshe, can you press it again? And uh, I would say that the main task is bridging the gap, okay, from um, impressive concepts, okay, something very smart that needs to be bring innovation into that world and hopefully turn over, you know, the, that specific uh, healthcare, healthcare issue and between actually bringing that to the market. And we see that as early as the relationship is established between the innovative uh, company and the larger players, uh, the more, I would say, safer is the path that we're going to make together and enlarging the, the actual, you know, chances that this development will be completed in a successful way and uh, be pushed into the market. Um, so that's basically what I had to say. Uh, Moshe, do we have a few minutes for Q&A? Yeah, I think we do. Yeah, it's really safer for okay. all sides, right? Because so the investors are reducing their risk because they got a strategic or multiple strategics or whatever interested at an early stage, right? And the strategics are reducing the risk because they know what's going on, right? They're not waiting uh, for somebody to come up uh, and, and to succeed, but they have influence. Uh, and of course, the developer, uh, you know, there, there are upsides and downsides to this, but basically the developers or the uh, uh, the entrepreneurs are also reducing their risk because they're getting better feedback uh, from potential buyers at an earlier stage. Uh, and they're sort mm -hmm. of uh, bridging uh, all three of the uh, sides of this triangle uh, much uh, earlier on. Right. I, yeah. I think by the way, Moshe, even in the past, it makes sense. But today, you know, there's a real understanding that this is uh, like, going on a safer ground for all aspects, and it's a win-win-win at the end of the day. Yeah, so we like to innovate, but uh, yeah, we like risk reduction as well. The trick is really exactly. to do both. Yeah, so okay. thanks. Yeah, so we, we do have a time uh, for a few questions, and uh, yeah, anybody else who wants to write in uh, some questions are also uh, very welcome. Somebody asked if we'll be uh, sharing uh, a recording of the event, so yeah, in a few days, uh, we'll be posting uh, a video of, uh, of the webinar. Uh, and we'll share that with you uh, via email. Any any more questions uh, from your side, uh, uh, Shmulik, uh, coming in? Do you Just see a it? Second. Yeah. So I have a question here from uh, Mike. Um, how far are we from autonomous procedures, and should surgeons be worried? Okay, that's a big one. <laughs> Moshe, would you like to address that? Yeah, there's a, there's always a question along uh, these lines in some way. So I think the surgeons uh, uh, should not be worried at all, and I don't think they're worried either. I think the surgeons uh, should be uh, excited because uh, uh, really the the concept is not uh, uh, to replace uh, surgeons in any way. Just as you know, uh, uh, ro robotic uh, surgery uh, a few decades ago, you know, uh, gave the surgeons uh, sort of uh, uh, more hands, more precise hands, gave the surgeons uh, the ability uh, to pause and to sit more ergonomically. Uh, so today, AI is giving surgeons uh, the ability, for instance, uh, to see, you know, the accumulated ex experience of thousands of other surgeons uh, at the touch of a button that's just operationalized in an AI. So it's giving them uh, more information or all the visual enhancements I'm talking about 
you know, the visual mapping, it's, it's just reducing their cognitive load, right? Uh, so, uh, you know, uh, we talked about ground truth, right? So uh, scene, mapping of a scene is something a surgeon does in his mind's eye at, at, at all times. This is a, a task that surgeons know how to do. And the idea of using AI for this is not to replace that, it's just to reduce the cognitive load. It's to make things easier uh, on the more uh, technical and, you know, uh, uh, measurement and uh, visual side and give the surgeons the opportunity to, uh, you know, concentrate more uh, really uh, on the clinical side and on treating that specific patient uh, based on their uh, uh, capabilities. Okay. Thank you, Musa. Um, maybe another, my, another one from my side. Fries is asking, is there room for procedure-specific surgical robotics, uh, like some kind of a biopsy robot, when systems like the Da Vinci exist? Yeah, that's another thing that we, uh, we actually see today. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. There, there, there definitely is. I, I think you know all, all, all the companies who are building a, a different types of robots, or some of them a, a low-cost uh, robots for uh, you know non-conventional uh, environments or, or focus on specific procedures. Uh, they, they know what they're doing, right? There's there's a huge market uh, for surgical robotics beyond uh, uh, you know the big medical centers and beyond uh, uh, what we think today of a uh, surgical robot. And I think. Uh, we'll be seeing uh, uh, many uh, creative solutions and, and task-specific uh, and environment-specific uh, robotic solutions. Uh, and even uh, the definition of what is a surgical robot is is uh, is going to be uh, become wider than than what we're accustomed to uh, today. And uh, and all of these uh, uh, offerings are are in some way going to want to to be using. Uh, uh, imaging to be collecting imaging and to be providing specific, uh, uh, you know, computer vision enhancements uh, for their specific uh, use cases. Yeah, over over here, there's a question uh, sort of about uh, uh, the type of collaborations uh, that we're specifically open to. So partnership uh, on the validation and clinical applications. Uh, so uh, yeah, Shmulik, I guess uh, so somebody uh, uh, was uh, was very impressed by uh, by what you were uh, saying. So. Uh, we, we're uh, we're sort of uh, uh, we're, we're at, at the core. Uh, uh, you, you could argue if you watch, but but sort of a, the DNA of the company is is really a, an AI company and a, a computer vision software company, right? And and what we're uh, 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 building up now and and uh, and uh, have been doing uh, over the last couple of years is doing sort of a vertical integration in the sense that uh, we're uh, combining uh, you know the uh, core competency in the algorithms and in the software. With the validation and with the uh, clinical aspect, right? So uh, currently, at least, we're we're not offering a, a you know a, a, a specific uh, a validation or clinical only uh, service. This usually comes together with actually building uh, the solution. Uh, but it's it's actually an interesting uh, idea, I think, uh, going forward. So you never know. But but for now, really, the focus is is uh, uh, solving a computer vision problem, turning that into a full system. And turning that into a full uh, clinical system uh, for use in medical device. Right. Maybe I'll just you, say that. You know, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was just going to say that you know, like we said before, there's maybe a debate is the R and D more challenging of a data one. But I always say that the commercial aspect should be easier because if it's a win-win, you know, it makes sense to collaborate, work together. We'll find the path. It's it's a at the end of the day, it's a, Case by case issues. So, if that specific yeah. one wants to uh, reach out, we'll be happy to discuss in private. Okay. Yeah, I think I think we got time for like one more. It's uh, 11:46 Pacific, 9:46 p.m. in Israel. So yeah, we're only a minute over. I think we can go a couple minutes over. Okay. Any more questions? Just a second. I'll see here. Well, I have one uh, asking, do you have other examples for clinical applications of measurements of 3D uh, reconstruction? From uh, Todd, I'm sorry, I got to say. Yeah, sure. So I, I, I showed uh, uh, sort of a, a, a potential uh, intraoperative type of application, right? So, so surgeons are using surgical rulers uh, uh, as a measurement tool, and this is a very natural application of computer vision, right? If, uh, you, you track a couple points and, and you have a uh, some sort of tool in the field that can be used as a kind of virtual ruler, uh, and that that opens sort of a, up a general purpose intraoperative uh, measurement uh, application. Uh, now, now uh, regarding any other applications, the the most natural one that comes to time to mind, uh, excuse me, is really preoperative measurements, right? So, for instance, in planning in uh, orthopedic surgery, you need to 
uh, uh, know uh, uh, how to and where to position the implant. You want to select the size of the implant. All this is based on uh, landmarks that you detect in a, in a pre-op imaging, and that's a, a very uh, uh, common task uh, uh, for surgical planning uh, that involves precise measurements, uh, in this case, in the pre-op imaging. Yeah, and I'll, I'll, I'll agree with you. You know, uh, I have a lot of years of in, experience in the cardiology, so it's all about you know measuring volumes, right, and things like that. Sure. So there's a lot to be done. It could yeah. be uh, in the screening process, could be intra-op, could be you know even after the, the procedure itself to make sure that everything works as planned, of course. So many many use cases around that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Definitely, and that that also sort of uh, you know uh, not not in this case a cognitive load, but really uh, you know just a workload reduction thing, right? So instead of manually, uh, I mean, uh, as skilled operators can definitely manually uh, uh, measure uh, you know the ejection fraction uh, uh, in a cardiac ultrasound or or whatever, but automating it uh, just uh, takes a lot of uh, uh, you know uh, grunt work uh, off of their hands, uh, and then of course uh, if you're talking about uh, unskilled operators, then uh, it becomes even more critical. Definitely. All right. Thanks, okay. guys. Okay, so uh, again, we'll, we'll be sharing the recording of this. Please feel free to reach out uh, uh, to either or or uh, or each of us uh, uh, via email or via LinkedIn. And we'll uh, be happy uh, to talk to you all and to see you all at uh, future webinars and other events of RSTP Vision. Thanks, everybody, for joining. Thank and you, everybody. Bye-bye. Have a good one. Bye, guys.